primarily living on a 1.5 million acre reservation in northeastern Arizona, the Hopi, meaning peaceful ones, have the longest authenticated history of occupation of a single area by any Native American tribe in the United States. Thought to have migrated north out of Mexico around 500 BCE, the Hopi have always lived in the Four Corners area of the United States. In the beginning, they were a hunting and gathering group divided into numerous small bands that lived in pit houses. However, around the year 700 CE, the Hopi became an agricultural people growing blue ears of corn using runoff from the mesas. From 900 to 1100 CE, many small masonry villages appeared in the area. Subsequent drying of the climate over the next 200 years saw a clustering of the area's population into larger villages in Canyon de Chile. It was about this time that the Kachina cult began within the Hopi people. Though no one knows for sure how it originated, there is evidence today of Kachina art found in the Paroco ruins in Petrified Forest National Park that dates to about 1150 CE and other evidence of Kachina mask and dancers appearing in rock art around 1325 CE. By the 15th century, the culture of the masked dancers and carved dolls is known to have become part of the culture of various Puebloan tribes in the southwest, and in the next century, the Spanish began to document having seen bizarre images of the devil hanging in Pueblo homes. These were most likely Kachina dolls. The Kachina practices and ceremonies continue to this day. By the 16th century, the Hopi culture was highly developed with an elaborate ceremonial cycle, complex social organization, and advanced agricultural system. They also participated in an elaborate trade network that extended throughout the Southwest and into Mexico. The Hopi enjoyed a peaceful way of life until the first outsiders arrived in Hopi territory in 1540. Under the leadership of Don Pedro de Tabar, the Spanish were looking for the legendary Seven Cities of Gold. The Spaniards were not received with friendliness at first, but the opposition of the natives was soon overcome, and the party remained among the Hopi for several days learning from them of the existence of the Grand Canyon. When they were unsuccessful in the search for the precious metal, they returned to Mexico but continued to maintain sporadic contact. In 1592, the Spanish returned when Catholic priests established a mission at Awa Tovi. For the next nine decades, the priests would attempt to suppress the Hopi religion and convert the tribe to Catholicism. In 1680, the Hopi joined the Puebloans of New Mexico in the Pueblo Revolt, which forced the Spanish out of the southwest. Although the Spanish were successful in reconquering the Pueblos, they were never able to firmly re-establish a foothold among the Hopi. Following on the heels of the Spanish, the Navajo, who were also under pressure from the Europeans, began moving into Hopi territory in the late 1600s. The peaceful Hopi were forced to battle for their survival in a long period of fighting that would last until 1824 when Spain recognized Mexico and the Hopi lands were given to the new Mexican government. Though no longer having to face the Spanish, the Navajo continued to attack the Hopi until they were forced onto reservations in 1864. In 1848, the United States and Mexico signed the Treaty of Guadalupe de Hidalgo, once more changing the jurisdiction under which the Hopi lands were governed. After the area became part of the United States, white settlers began to explore the area in greater numbers and in 1870, the U.S. government laid claim to the lands of the Hopi. Once again, the Hopi were forced to fight to save their lands until finally they were forced onto the reservation in Black Mesa in 1882, where most of them still live today. Once on the reservation, the U.S. government spent years attempting to eradicate the Hopi culture and religion. Children were made to go to school, men and boys were forced to cut their hair, and efforts to convert the Hopi to Christianity intensified. Ultimately, this resulted in the incarceration of a Hopi chief and 18 others being placed in Alcatraz for their resistance to the forced culture. From January 3rd to August 7th, 1895, 
The group was imprisoned for their resistance to farm on individual plots away from the mesas and for refusing to send their children to government boarding schools. In 1934, a changing tide of sentiment towards Native Americans led to the Indian Reorganization Act, which codified the obligations of the U.S. government to protect and preserve the rights of Native Americans. Soon after, the Hopi Tribal Council was formed in 1936 to establish a single representative body of the Hopi with which the U.S. government could do business. Like other Native American tribes, the Hopi lands were drastically reduced, and their current reservation represents only 9% of their original land holdings. Originally, they occupied almost all of northern Arizona from California to parts of southern Nevada. Now, the Hopi Reservation in Black Mesa, Arizona is surrounded by the Navajo Reservation and is where the vast majority of the Hopi live today. The Hopi maintain a complex religious tradition stretching back over centuries. However, it is difficult to definitely state what all Hopis as a group believe. Like the oral traditions of many other societies, Hopi beliefs are not always told consistently, and each Hopi Mesa, or even each village, may have its own version of a particular story. But, in essence, the variants of the Hopi beliefs are markedly similar to one another. It is also not clear that those stories which are told to non-Hopis, such as anthropologists and ethnographers, represent genuine Hopi beliefs or are merely stories told to the curious while keeping safe the Hopi's more sacred doctrines. In addition, the Hopi's have always been willing to assimilate foreign ideas into their cosmology, if they are proven effective. Remember that the Hopi had at least some contact with Europeans as early as the 16th century, and some believe that European Christian traditions may have entered Hopi cosmology at some point. Indeed, Spanish missions were built in several Hopi villages starting in 1629 and were in operation until the Pueblo Revolt of 1680. However, after the revolt, it was the Hopi alone of all the Pueblo tribes who kept the Spanish out of their villages permanently, and regular contact with whites did not begin again until nearly two centuries later. The Hopi mesas have therefore been viewed as relatively unacculturated at least through the early 20th century. Most Hopi accounts of creation center around Tawa, the sun spirit. Tawa is the creator, and it was he who formed the first world out of Tukpela, or endless space, as well as its original inhabitants. It is still traditional for Hopi mothers to seek a blessing from the sun for their newborn children. Other accounts have it that Tawa first created Sotuknang, whom he called his nephew and sent him to create the nine universes according to his plan. Sotuknang also created Spider Woman, who served as a messenger of the Creator and was an intercessor between the deity and the people. In some versions of the Hopi creation myth, it is she who creates all life under the direction of Sotuknang. Masal also known as Skeleton Man, was the spirit of death, earth god, doorkeeper to the fifth world, and the keeper of fire. He was also the master of the upper world or the fourth world and was there when the good people escaped the wickedness of the third world for the promise of the fourth. Masal is described as wearing a hideous mask, but Masal was alternatively described as a handsome bejeweled man beneath his mask or as a bloody fearsome creature. He is also assigned certain benevolent attributes. One story has it that it was Masal who helped settle the Hopi at Arabi and gave them stewardship over the land. He also charged them to watch for the coming of the Pahana, the lost white brother. According to the Hopi legend, when time and space began, the sun spirit created the first world in which insect-like creatures lived unhappily in caves. With the goal of improvement, Tawa sent a spirit called Spider Grandmother to the world below. Spider Grandmother led the first creatures on a long trip to the second world, during which they took on the appearance of wolves and bears. 
As these animals were no happier than the previous ones, Tawa created a new, third world and again sent Spider Grandmother to convey the wolves and bears there. By the time they arrived, they had become people. Two main versions exist as to the Hopi's emergence into the present fourth world. In one version, after evil broke out amongst the people in the third world, with the help of spider grandmother or bird spirits, a hollow bamboo reed grew at the opening of the third world into the fourth. This opening is traditionally viewed to be the Grand Canyon, and only the people with good hearts made it to the fourth world. The other version, mainly told in Arabi, has it that Tawa destroyed the third world in a great flood. Before the destruction, Spider Grandmother sealed the more righteous people into hollow reeds which were used as boats. On arrival on a small piece of dry land, the people saw nothing around them but more water, even after planting a large bamboo shoot, climbing to the top, and looking about. Spider Woman then told the people to make boats out of more reeds, and using island stepping stones along the way, the people sailed east until they arrived on the mountainous coast of the fourth world. In this fourth world, the people learn many lessons about the proper way to live. They learn to worship Masal, who ensured that the dead returned safely to the underworld, and who gave them four sacred tablets that, in symbolic form, outlined their wanderings and their proper behavior in the fourth world. Masal also told the people to watch for the Pahana, the lost white brother. One of the Hopi religious societies is the Katsina Society. According to the Hopi, reflecting the close association between the world of the living and that of the dead, spirits play an integral role in the land of the living. They are associated with clouds and with benevolent supernatural entities called Katsinam, which inhabit the San Francisco peaks just north of Flagstaff, Arizona. The Hopi consider the Katsinam to be the spirits of all things in the universe, of rocks, stars, animals, plants, and ancestors who have lived good lives. The Hopi say that during a great drought, they heard singing and dancing coming from the San Francisco peaks. Upon investigation, they met the Kachinas who returned with the Hopi to their villages and taught them various forms of agriculture. The Hopi believe that for six months of the year, Kachina spirits live in the Hopi villages. The nine-day Nyman, or Going Home Ceremony, concludes the Kachina season with an outdoor Kachina dance where the line of Kachinas bring harvest gifts for the spectators and Kachina dolls for the young girls. Different sets of Kachinas perform every year. Most favored is the Hemis group of Kachinas, who perform accompanied by a variety of Kachina manas. After the Going Home dance in late July or early August, the Kachinas returned to the San Francisco peaks for six months. The Hopi believe that these dances are vital for the continued harmony and balance of the world. Hopi tradition tells of sacred tablets which were imparted to the Hopi by various deities. Like most Hopi traditions, accounts differ as to when the tablets were given and in precisely what manner. Perhaps the most important was said to be in the possession of the Fire Clan and is related to the return of the Pahana. In one version, an elder of the Fire Clan worried that his people would not recognize the Pahana when he returned from the east. He therefore etched various designs, including a human figure, into a stone and then broke off the section of the stone which included the figure's head. This section was given to Pahana, and he was told to bring it back with him so that the Hopi would not be deceived by a witch or sorcerer. The true Pahana is the lost white brother of the Hopi. Most versions have it that the Pahana or elder brother left for the east at the time that the Hopi entered the fourth world and began their migrations. However, the Hopi say that he will return, and at his coming the wicked will be destroyed and a new age of peace, the fifth world, will be ushered into the world. As mentioned above, it is said that he will bring with him a missing section of a sacred Hopi stone in the possession of the Fire Clan, and that he will come wearing red. Traditionally, Hopis are buried facing east in expectation of the Pahana who will come from that direction. 
The legend of the Pahana seems intimately connected with the Aztec story of Quetzalcoatl and other legends of Central America. This similarity is furthered by the representation of Awanu, the horned or plumed serpent in Hopi and other Puebloan art. This figure resembles Quetzalcoatl, the feathered serpent of Mexico. In the early 16th century, both the Hopis and the Aztecs believed that the coming of the Spanish conquistadors was the return of this lost white prophet. Unlike the Aztecs, upon first contact, the Hopi put the Spanish through a series of tests in order to determine their divinity, and having failed, the Spanish were sent away from the Hopi mesas. So why is the archive focusing on the Hopi, you may ask? Researcher Gary David has spent nearly three decades delving into Hopi culture and history. He has pointed out several potential connections between the Hopi and other worldly beings. The Hopi are connected to many different entities that we might think of as extraterrestrial today. They have the idea of the sky people or sky elders coming down to the earth. One particular group of people that the Hopi have talked about in their legends are the ant people, a very important group that helped the Hopi out during the destruction of two different worlds. As mentioned earlier, Hopi belief is that we are currently in the fourth world. The first world was destroyed by fire, which may have manifested itself as an asteroid strike or some kind of volcanism. The second world was destroyed by ice, indicating the ice age or extremely cold period. The ant people led the Hopis down into caverns where they survived the terrible cataclysms being suffered by the earth. The ant people also taught the Hopis to sprout beans in the caverns in order to feed the people, an event commemorated even today by the ritual bean dance. The ant people are basically benevolent creatures. In the rock art, there are antennae on these creatures, and they have spindly bodies and large eyes and bulbous heads. The friendly ant people seem to have left the Hopis to their own devices when the time came for the third world to be destroyed in a terrible flood. In that disaster, the Hopis survived by going across the ocean on bamboo rafts to arrive at our present fourth world, and the ant people dropped out of the story. But other helpers soon came along. It has been suggested that there is also a linguistic link between the Anunnaki of ancient Sumeria. The Hopi word for ant is Anu, and the Hopi word for friends is Naki. So, the ant people could conceivably be the same as the Anunnaki of the Sumerians. There is a legend about Sotuknang related to the flood. Indeed, it is noteworthy that this god has a curved headdress similar to a helmet and looks very much like an alien being. According to the story, a great flood was about to engulf a Hopi village, and the people were fleeing the coming destruction. There was a little boy and girl, twins, who were somehow left behind. They decided to try to find their parents and escape the flood. They went out across the desert, and during the first night they saw what is called a flying shield come down right before them. This being, this sky creature, got out of this flying shield. He was described in the legend as having clothing that glittered like icicles, and his face shone like a star. This might be some kind of interdimensional being, David posits, or it might be that the helmet is lit up in some fashion. But... This creature came to the children and said, Don't be afraid, I'm going to take you into my flying shield and we're going to go above the desert and find your parents. Reminiscent of the Book of Enoch, these two children are taken up into this flying shield many miles above the desert. So Tuknang told the children that in the future he would come to them in their dreams and instruct them in the proper way to live and the proper life to pursue. So Tuknang located the twins' parents and delivered the children to them, after which the flying shield took off again. Another Hopi god with extraterrestrial overtones is Masal. Indeed, Masal is a strange-looking creature. He has a bulbous head and exceptionally large round eyes and a large round mouth. And he is kind of bald. His feet are very long, and his body is always described as being gray. 
Artists have made drawings based upon the descriptions that the Hopi elders have made of this particular god, and it really looks like an extraterrestrial gray. Our contemporary idea of what a gray looks like matches this ancient Hopi god perfectly. As mentioned earlier, Masal was there at the beginning of the fourth world and determined where they should build their villages. The people were basically migrating across the desert and building stone pueblos. They would live in these pueblos for maybe a century or less, and then they would abandon things and move on to another place. The god Masal was with them along the journey. That is where Mr. David believes this pattern of the Orion constellation on the desert of Arizona was fixed. There seems to be an undeniable connection between the Hopi and the Orion constellation. The natural structure of the three Hopi mesas mirrors the three stars in the belt of Orion, and it is said that this is why the Hopi chose to settle in this location. They believe this place to be the center of their universe where they can make contact with the gods. Furthermore, when connected to other Hopi monuments and landmarks around the southwest, the collective sites are said to map the entire constellation of Orion. A couple of years ago, the archive produced an in-depth video about the Orion connection and a link has been provided in the description. Before we close out this presentation, the archive wanted to touch on the Hopi prophecy involving what is called the Blue Star Kachina. In Frank Waters' writings on Hopi tradition, the Blue Star Kachina is a Kachina that will signify the coming of the fifth world by appearing in the form of a blue star. The Blue Star Kachina is said to be the ninth and final sign before the Day of Purification, described as an apocalypse or a world-engulfing cataclysm that will lead to the annihilation of planet Earth. The Archive has planned a full-length video covering this topic, so make sure you subscribe to this channel and sign up for notifications to make sure you do not miss this future presentation. We hope you enjoyed this presentation on the ancient Hopi tribe. Regardless of whether you believe that Hopi religion and tradition is based on extraterrestrial visitation or not, the history of this Native American people is rich and filled with fascination. <laughs>